Believe it or not, we have reached our last session of the weekend. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Adam Marblestone. He is the Chief Strategy Officer of Kernel and a part-time research assistant with the Synthetic Neurobiology Group at MIT. With George Church, he co-authored experimental and theoretical papers on molecular recording devices and whole brain mapping. Prior to his work in brain science, he studied quantum non-locality, showing how quantum entanglement can exponentially enhance certain forms of distributed computation. He's here to talk about the speed of progress in neuroscience. Please join me in welcoming Adam Marblestone. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for, for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be part of the mental space comprised by this very diverse uh, conference. Um, I guess neuroscience is not really a bread and butter topic of effective altruism yet. It's kind of a minority topic, although it, it has had a little, a little bit of play um, in, in this group. Um, but, and I, I don't want to argue that it, it should be different than that, but, but, but I do feel that um, even though kind of in normal life we don't talk about the, the brain that much, um, in part because we know so little about it, I do think that especially if we're thinking about the far future of humanity, it's, it's, a, it's a very important problem, I would even say elephant in the room kind of, kind of issue um, in terms of at what point do we understand the brain and what, what does that mean? Um, and th there are various reasons that, that I think are pretty obvious. Um, one that, that, that I think will matter a lot is uh, I think the, the brain is, is likely to be surprisingly connected with getting true artificial intelligence, um, which is something that EA really does care about. Um, but uh, kind of at a more basic level, it's also understanding ourselves and psychology and sort of what, what will humans become in the, in the far future. So, so even, even if it's, it's not a super near-term topic, I think it is, I would argue that, that solving the brain, understanding how the brain works is, is critical, um, and when that happens is critical for, for the future of humanity. Um, and of course, many people have realized this, mostly, mostly in the form of governments, um, but uh, more, more recently uh, with some, some uh, very major kind of philanthropic and, and now uh, corporate interest in, in doing somewhat more ambitious things in, in neuroscience. Um, but it's worthwhile, I think, to think about, you know, we, we still don't understand the brain very well at all. Um, it's, you know, progress is being made, but, but how far are we? And, and what, what are the, the key leverage points? And, I think when, when I look at the field, uh, the, the, big, the big leverage point that I see basically is, is, has to do with the structure of, of neuroscience. This is related to what, what Kevin Esfeld said uh, yesterday around there's no reason a priori to expect that the scientific research enterprise is optimally structured uh, for solving uh, the actual object level scientific problems. It's an institution that evolved um, and is basically based on individual in, in incentives. Um, and so if, if you go to a, a neuroscience conference, this is the Society for Neuroscience meeting, um, which has about 30,000 neuroscientists attending uh, every year. Um, what what uh, Christoph Koch, who's the director of the Allen Institute for Brain Science, called is a sociological big bang. So everybody's working on a different topic. Some people are thinking about Alzheimer's, some people are thinking about the hippocampus. Um, many people are, are thinking about essentially completely orthogonal topics. And basically this, this somehow has to change if we're going to actually solve, solve the brain. So, so this doesn't scale well with the complexity of the problem. And, and of course, in, in fields like, like physics um, over the last, and astronomy over the last century or so, um, there was this major transition um, where, of course, there's still a lot of individual research programs going on, but the field as a whole sort of started to agree on, on the need for large-scale systems engineering and also large-scale integration of, of uh, theoretical ideas with things like the standard model. And because they have the standard model and they kind of know what questions they want to ask, they can spend billions of dollars to make a city-sized particle accelerator that has thousands of people working on it, um, all to contribute to this, essentially the same project. So the, the, the question that, that I think the field needs to ask right now is what is, what is the analog of that? Um, in, in neuroscience and even in, in biology generally, sort of deep unsolved questions in biology. How do you extend some sort of systems engineering or systematic um, joint approach into, into really the science of complexity, which, which is the brain? And this, this to me all has to do with integration of, of ideas and methods. And what is it that we want to integrate? What would it look like if we were to integrate? Um, and I have a particular take on this. Um, obviously, uh, a lot to cover in a, in a 20, 
a 20 minute talk. Um, but, but my particular take on that is that there's a few different types of integration we need to do. One is, one is we need to integrate the technologies to the point where we can make maps of, of the brain um, that, that kind of reveal uh, the structure of the brain at, at, at all of the relevant uh, scales at once. Um, and two is that we need to integrate theories. Um, and a, a lot of integrating of theories, I think, has to do with the crosstalk with artificial intelligence. Um, and in particular, uh, these maps and uh, progress in AI can together basically inspire um, integrative theories, which then can allow us to take the next step uh, in neuroscience and have a better idea of what questions we even need to ask in the first place. Um, and then, of course, this I expect we'll have a lot of crosstalk for AI itself um, in the process of doing that. So I'm just going to tell a few stories uh, quickly about projects that, that we and others have been working on that, that I think uh, try to go in this direction of, of integration. So, so first, uh, technology integration to enable comprehensive maps. And it's, it's, it's interesting uh, to realize like how, how radical, in some ways, it is to say that we're going to make a complete map of the brain compared to the way neuroscientists have thought about this. So, so this is Francis Crick. I think he was unequivocally, at least in, in my opinion, the best biologist of the 20th century, um, discovered the structure of DNA, many other things, and then moved into neuroscience. Um, he said, it's no use asking for the impossible, such as, say, the exact wiring diagram for a cubic millimeter of brain tissue in the way all its neurons are firing. That's impossible and, 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 and no use asking for it. Um, now, the mouse brain, by the way, is you know, about 1,000 times as big as a cubic millimeter. So if it's impossible to get an exact map for a cubic millimeter, um, that means we really have to think about neuroscience in a certain way. It essentially means we have to know in advance the questions that we need to ask so that we can go and do very targeted, uh, sparse experiments to, to look at those, those particular questions, because we're not going to be able to get a full picture view of the whole system. Um, and indeed, it is a very challenging problem to get a full picture view of the whole system, in part because a single cell in the brain can go from one end all the way to the other, and yet that wire is you know, nanometers thin, and they're very densely packed. Um, so this is, this is just a one one thousandth of a millimeter scale bar here, and there's so much going on, even in just a tiny, tiny region. So this is indeed a very difficult problem. And for a long time, uh, there's been only one technology approach that can even conceivably uh, go in this direction. And so it's what everyone has been trying to do. It's called electron microscopy. It has enough spatial resolution that you can see the individual wires of neurons. But uh, it's basically a black and white uh, map um, that doesn't have any other way of distinguishing one neuron from another. So you have to interpret the entire map just by slicing, stitching together lots of tiny uh, slices of grayscale imagery. And there will be uh, hundreds of thousands of slices that you have to go through to get through any significant volume. And you have to trace this. And so what it meant uh, is that it took for about 50 person years to, to do this for the smallest uh, uh, brain, which is only 302 neurons. And so if you imagine trying to do that for the entire mouse brain, uh, which has about 100 million neurons, uh, it's, it's extremely prohibitive to imagine doing that. There's major progress being made in trying to automate these processes and also automate the analysis. But I still think the, the entire, an entire brain is still sort of out of reach of, of this approach, um, at, least, at least for now. Um, so, so what we've been trying to do with a, with a large collaborative project that's actually funded um, by, largely by IARPA and in part by the, the Open Philanthropy Project, actually, um, is, is to try to, try to bring in a, a bunch of ideas from chemistry, um, not from neuroscience, um, to try to figure out how to get an infinity of colors to label the different neurons. So we want to go from black and white, which is basically one color, um, to an infinity of, of effective colors that allow us to distinguish the neurons. Um, and that would make this mapping process much more scalable. So the way that this works, how do you get an infinity of something? There's very few things that you can have an, effectively an infinity of. One of them is DNA sequences. Um, so there are four letters of DNA, A, C, T, and G. And if I was to go uh, 20 letters, I would have four to the 20 possibilities, or 30 letters, four to the 30 possibilities. And that is more than the number of neurons in the mouse brain. So the, the trick, which was originally proposed by uh, a scientist named Tony Zador, is can we give each neuron a unique sequence of DNA? We do this with viruses. And then we have those sequences uh, trafficked um, down the wires of the neuron. And then we try to read uh, those sequences uh, in the microscope by, by, by looking um, and doing chemistry. Um, and from that, we try to get the connections. So, so we call this a four to the n color microscopy. And really what it is is four color microscopy that you do it um, n times. So if you take 20 four color images and you can read the sequence letter by letter, 
of these molecules of DNA, you can uniquely label the neurons. Um, and what that lets you do, uh, let's see, it's a video. It might have been a video. Uh, basically what happens is you, you, you put uh, these, these DNAs in the neurons, and what, they, what happens is they blink out uh, a sequence of colors at you. Um, and uh, from the sequence of colors, you can reconstruct back the identity of that neuron. And you can do that uh, whether on the left half of the brain or your, your centimeters away on the right half of the brain at the same sequence. And so you know uniquely which neuron you're looking at. Um, it's been a problem to do that at enough spatial resolution that you could actually see the connections between neurons. So this is uh, schematizing one neuron um, connected to another through a synapse. Um, you can label the synapse with a, with a different color. And then on one side, um, you'll have one of these DNA barcodes. On the other side, you'll have another DNA barcode. The question is, um, can you identify that, that the one is paired with the other? If you can, then just by looking at that point, you know that those neurons are connected without having to trace these grayscale images over uh, a huge stack. The problem is that uh, the resolution of the microscopes used to do this kind of uh, readout of the information from DNA uh, hasn't been uh, high enough. So uh, there comes in another trick uh, from Ed Boyden's lab at MIT, where instead of making the light smaller, uh, what they actually do is they physically make the, uh, the brain tissue bigger um, by swelling it. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of chemistry behind that, um, but in fact it works. So this is the same uh, piece of brain tissue um, imaged on the same microscope before and after uh, being physically expanded. Um, and what you see is that you can actually uh, see much, much finer details. Um, so we've been doing that to read this infinity of, of uh, DNA effective colors or, or color codes. Um, and we're getting, we're getting close to being able to, to actually uh, uniquely identify, in principle, every neuron in the mouse brain um, just from a single um, snapshot. So uh, here's again, again Crick. And then we have George Church, who we saw yesterday um, on the basis of, of this integration of, of DNA sequencing and microscopy and, and uh, swelling brain tissue and many other technologies. Uh, George says that he thinks that doing, it, doing just a cubic millimeter is extraordinarily myopic. And uh, his goals are, are much wider. Um, I think that's, that's the right attitude. It's a very big change um, from the way that Francis Crick uh, saw the field. So I think that this is, this is uh, important to push forward, um, because then uh, we can b basically gain a, a kind of comprehensive view of the system. And if, we really think, if, we, if, if I really thought that we had a, a good hypothesis already for how the brain works, then we wouldn't necessarily need these complete maps. But uh, given where we are, uh, this kind of science, I think, needs a different level of comprehensiveness of, of the data. Um, and this, this would actually allow that. Um, the other side of integration um, isn't so much integration of technologies, um, but is integration of theories. And of course, in, in physics, we saw that uh, with the creation of things like the standard model. Uh, because physics is formulated already in terms of math, it's, it's somehow much easier um, to, to bring things together, although uh, still not, not every area of physics is completely unified theoretically. But, but you can at least see how you might get started, um, whereas in neuroscience, um, we really don't have that kind of unified picture. So where, where could that possibly come from? And I think that uh, actually uh, artificial intelligence integrating with neuroscience is going to be really key for that. Um, so the way that, that modern AI um, is largely making progress is with this field of so-called artificial neural networks. Um, and artificial neural networks uh, only bear a very superficial relationship with uh, with, with real neuroscience. They basically are inspired by what we knew about neuroscience in the 1950s, which is that the brain is composed of these individual elements called neurons. They have connections, and then those connections can, can change in strength, and that based on the changes in strength of those connections, you can build up different computations um, that a network can give rise to. Um, so this is basically uh, what is now called deep learning, and the way it, it largely works uh, is, is by using mathematical techniques to optimize these so-called connection strengths or weights of a neural network um, in order to optimize some function that the user wants to do. Um, so maybe you want to classify images or generate speech, um, take a network, optimize it uh, until it gets better and better at doing that. And that's basically uh, how artificial neural networks work. This is not a framework that has been used in neuroscience itself to try to explain how the brain works. Um, very much at all. And in fact, here's again actually the same Francis Crick um, saying that he thinks that these, these so-called backpropagation-based artificial neural networks uh, basically have nothing to do 
uh, with the brain. And it's, it's actually impossible that the brain, brain could do that. And this is actually the view that I think many neuroscientists um, have had is that there's really no, even though we call it artificial neural networks, the, the basic algorithm that's used to train the network um, and give it its computation has, in the brain has nothing to do with the way we do it in AI, in which case there's no opportunity for integration of those, those fields, and they might as well just proceed independently. And we, could pr we can prove theorems about optimization, but that has nothing to do with neuroscience. And um, I think that might not be the case. And in fact, uh, it, it is certainly true that the two fields speak very different languages right now. So, so if you go and you go to a machine learning conference, the things that are talked about are optimization, again, supervised learning. Um, now people are talking about augmenting neural networks with other kinds of structures like external memories um, to make them more like computers. Um, in neuroscience, you don't see any of those words generally used at the neuroscience conference. You mostly see words like circuits, representations, what does the area of the brain represent or code for, the neural code. Um, and we also think about things being built up out of individual computational motifs, kind of like little biological elements, Lego bricks, that you would stitch together. Um, now, uh, people have tried to build up uh, sort of functioning systems um, based on the neuroscience primitives that we know about um, without using machine learning as, as the concept. And they've made, in, including these things, integrative cognitive models, um, like one called Spawn here. And these are interesting, but they haven't uh, been able to do anything intelligent right now. So, so that's people have tried to kind of go in an AI direction based directly on neuroscience, but it hasn't quite, quite happened. Um, so a bunch of us have been thinking about uh, maybe these fields are more ripe for, for integration. Um, and, and one way to think about that is, let's, let's hypothesize. If, if you look at uh, the way we do artificial neural networks now um, in a computer, um, you have, again, this, this neural network that's being trained. The, the label is provided by the training data. Um, or by, effectively by a, by a human um, that intervenes, uh, the, the neural network is trying to, to generate um, something that matches that label. And it gets some error, and that error is used to, to update it. Yeah. What if we hypothesize that the brain actually does do something kind of like that? Um, but then, in, of course, in the brain, uh, you don't have an external human to provide you with the training data. You have to have some other part of the brain that basically generates the internal uh, cost signals um, or error functions that allows this thing to optimize. And so if, if we try to, try to take that hypothesis and see, you know, is it conceivable that that could be happening? Well, it turns out actually that, um, in my opinion, not only is it conceivable, but it actually could explain a lot of aspects of neuroscience that previously hasn't had very much explanation. So for example, why do neurons have the really complicated uh, shapes they have and multi multiple compartments? They're not just little spheres. Um, they have many, many compartments and they have these crazy tree-like shapes um, that don't seem like they're just minimizing the connection distance. Um, so this paper actually suggests that, that the reason for those shapes is so that the, the brain can effectively do something very similar to deep learning optimization. Um, it also suggests many differences in how we would think about AI. Um, so so in, in training an artificial neural network to do image classification or something, there's usually one objective function, like minimize the classification error. In the brain, it's clear that there are many different objective functions uh, operating in parallel in different parts of the system. And uh, again, mapping. Um, some of those connections. For, exa for example, these are connections going into the area called the basal forebrain, which then sends a molecule called acetylcholine to many different parts of the brain. Um, that's a, that th those look like they might be cost signals or error signals. And if we could map that structure, um, we might actually be able to understand what is the diversity of, of those uh, objective functions that are used in the brain. It's also possible that the brain is using many different molecules to encode different objective functions. Uh, this is a, a nervous system, part of the nervous system of the crab, uh, it has only has uh, about 30 neurons. This, this is from actually the, the gut of the crab, the stomatogastric ganglion. But what's interesting about the system is it has more molecules that are used in neural signaling than it has uh, neurons. So, um, and finally, um, the brain is not just a uh, optimized artificial neural network. It also has many specialized structures or memory systems, for example, the hippocampus. Um, uh, which are used for specialized purposes. And so you can ask, well, doesn't that invalidate the idea that, that there's a connection between this kind of optimization-based framework of machine learning and neuroscience? I think the answer is, is, is probably, probably not. So, so certainly we do understand that the brain has, has a, a lot of specialized structure on, on, on different length scales. Um, 
and we can try to interpret that structure in terms of a large scale kind of control and memory systems in addition to optimization or learning. Um, but actually, if you look at the way that machine learning is evolving, this is also exactly the same thing is true um, in, in the way machine learning is going. So here you have a learning based artificial neural network that gets optimized, but it's interacting with a very specialized uh, memory architecture. And this is really the, sort of the state of the art in, in machine learning right now coming from, from DeepMind. So I actually think that, that these two things, the sort of structured architecture in the brain and the increasingly structured architecture of the machine learning may actually be converging a lot. Um, anyway, those are, those are two quick examples. Obviously too much to cover in, in 20 minutes, but, um, but fundamentally what, what, what this tells me is that uh, there's, there's a lot we can do uh, kind of with neuroscience uh, as it's been done, but there's also a lot of room. I, I, I think the field is limited by, by support for integrating different methods. So in order to do the mapping, we have to integrate many different types of chemistry and biology, even to come up with a technology that can do the mapping, yet alone uh, bring together all the facilities and microscopes and computer science and so on to, to, to actually make that map from an engineering sense. And in order to actually understand the brain, I think we're going to need to go outside of neuroscience and bring in a closer connection with AI. Um, so thanks a lot. All right, we've got a few minutes for questions. Let's take a seat. So that was a lot. You covered a lot very quickly. <laughs> um, boy, I'm not sure uh, exactly where to begin, but w one um, good question from the audience, and again, boston.eaglobal.org slash polls. Uh, you can submit your questions. How important is it, do you think, to simulate the cells in the brain that are not neurons, the glia cells, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think we definitely have to map those cells. Um, I think initially, though, I don't think we should go about it by trying to simulate every cell. I think we need to, need to try to focus on there's basically two classes of models that have been used in, in neuroscience. So, so one is like very biophysically correct, and you simulate not necessarily every molecule, but you try, to, you try to be as realistic about what each neuron is doing as possible. And, and on the other end, you have models that are functional, so they, they basically neglect most of the biology, but they actually do some useful computation, like in machine learning. And so I think that the sweet spot is to try to, to combine those two. And then you can say, okay, well, to combine those two, do I need to explicitly talk about glial cells? My guess is probably no. Um, but that's just at the level of a theory, right? So in order to actually go to the brain and say, how is that actually done? Um, then I think we actually do need to look at, at glial cells. And so we need to, we need to know about glial cells, um, but it comes at, but it doesn't happen by simulating them directly. It happens by having an idea about what they might do and then trying to, trying to test that idea. And that idea would come from both theories and, and from maps. Um, actually, in, in the, one of the examples I gave where, where potentially like cost signals or error signals for optimization are, are being routed around in the brain uh, with acetylcholine, it's actually the case that that is actually, glia, glia are actually known to be involved in that one. So uh, yes, yeah, so it's, it's definitely not just neurons. One piece of um, kind of popular news about the brain that, that came out recently was this notion that along the length of a neuron, there would be sort of a, uh, a, a completely different kind of electrical field that would be kind of controlled at a different frequency and in, in less of a like binary sort of firing or not firing way and more of kind of a continuous uh, value. I'm not sure if you're f familiar with that or if that has anything to do with uh, what you're talking yeah. about. But well, does that, that kind of pose the risk of like, we really just don't know what we don't know. That's yeah. kind of how I took it. Yeah, that's, and, and that's why I think we, we, we do really need this kind of very comprehensive new kinds of data. Um, because that, that kind of thing, it doesn't pop out from every way of measuring. You have to measure it enough, in a level of enough detail to actually see the membrane potential, let's say, to be able to see that kind of thing. And so there is still, you know, what I was describing was mapping the anatomy. And there's still, there's still a lot of open technology questions, I think, on how to, how to map the activity in a way that would actually show you all that. Um, I personally think that the anat a, lot, a lot can be gleaned from the anatomy, even without knowing those things. Um, but there's, there's certainly the potential for, for physiology to kind of really reveal unknown unknowns or total surprises, yeah. So a question about the technique that you were talking about with each neuron getting its own short code. 
um, I guess two questions there are, how does that work? <laughs> you have to get this <laughs> yeah. unique code into every you know, cell distinctly. Yeah. And then also, it's in all parts of the cell, so it's, it has to be kind of replicated and propagated through the cell. So that sure. that's like a huge technical challenge unto itself. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's something that, that uh, a number of us have been, been working on um, for a while. So, so, so one, one of the cool things about DNA, though, is that you can actually order off the internet a test tube in which every single molecule of DNA in that test tube is, is different. Um, because norm, you can, first of all, thing one, you can order DNA off the internet um, up, to a, <laughs> up, to a, up to a certain short length, like let's say 100 letters. Um, and normally, normally what, what people do is they, they first put the A, and then they put the T, and then they put the C, and then they put the G, and you, you synthesize a defined sequence. So every molecule in the test tube um, in parallel is getting the exact same thing done to it and building up letter by letter along the chain. Now, if at every step of that, I just give you all the letters in a mixture, um, instead of only one, then they're going to just randomly combine, and each molecule will actually be getting a different letter um, on each step. So you can make this test tube that has every molecule of DNA actually different from every other one in the sequence. And then you can just take that test tube um, and uh, splice the DNA into a virus, um, and then the virus um, will equally uptake any of those DNAs regardless of, of their differences. And then you take the viruses and you affect the brain, and you do it in such a way as each neuron only gets one or a few viruses. Um, and th if there's so many more possible sequences then, so even if I have 100 million neurons in the brain, if I have a trillion possible DNA sequences, the probability that two of those neurons are going to get the same, uh, a copy of the same sequence is just, so, is just astronomically low. And so it basically relies on, uh, again, weird combinations of chemistry and viruses to actually make that possible, which is not something that you could do in the time that Francis Crick was saying cubic millimeter is, is impossible. Um, yeah. yeah, that's clever. OK, uh, not too much more time, but a, a bunch of questions coming in. So we'll see if we can do a couple in uh, rapid fire here. Um, how do you think this has certainly been a theme of the conference, existential risk, especially as posed by AI? Um, what's your kind of view on that? And, and do these uh, fields converging make that worse? Uh, in terms of risk or, or better, what do you think? I think it's a really interesting question. So, so I, I know that um, some people have argued that doing AI in a neuroscience-based way would actually be a bad idea from an existential risk perspective. And I think, I think the intuition behind that is that uh, you're just kind of like copying something you don't understand. And so you, like, you don't, you're not able to prove theorems about it and prove, prove, it, prove that it's safe. Um, if you're just copying something. But, but I actually view it as potentially the opposite, is that we're developing a lot of algorithms uh, that we don't actually really understand at what point they will become intelligent or have different properties. And if we actually understand how the brain actually works, that will give, us, that will give rise to new math and new concepts that will then allow us to prove theorems and so on. And so there, there's multiple steps to it. Um, so I don't see that the neuroscience-based approach is just blindly copying what we have. I see it as giving us an intellectual toolkit to think about AI in a more advanced way. Um, and the brain, of course, is the only model case of something that is actually generally intelligent. Whereas it's, you, can, you can speculate, well, will deep learning take us all the way or not, or other things. But whatever the brain does, that will take us all the way. And so it's, it seems worthwhile to, have, to develop an intellectual understanding of that um, before you even face the question of, are we just copying it, or are we just proceeding, letting the industry proceed in whatever direction it's proceeding, and then trying to prove theorems about something that may or may not be what the industry is doing. But, but I think this is a very longer discussion and pretty interesting question. So, Are you familiar with Robin Hansen's concept of EMS, the emulated brain? And do you think that comes before or after traditional strong AI? This, I think it's possible to have very different opinions about that with, with the same like, state of knowledge as we have. My, my personal opinion is that it's, it's probably, um, it might be easier to extract principles from the brain and use that in algorithms um, and use that for AI than it would be to just make a perfect copy that actually functions. Um, other people you know, might say the opposite. It's very hard to extract principles from this messy biological system, and, but it is very easy to just run a simulation you know, cell by cell. And, I don't think we know that answer yet, um, but, it, but I think it, this is the kind of thing where it's important enough that I think we should do some more science to figure out which of those is likely to be correct, and we're not, we're not there yet. So. 
Cool. So last question, because um, we are just about out of time. What ideas do you have for specific cultural interventions along the lines that you sort of alluded to at the end that you think might be able to accelerate progress? That's a tricky question. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that the incentives are not always there to facilitate this kind of integration because uh, both of the methods and of, and of the, the ideas. Um, and so I think that we do have to support that. O oftentimes, like it's very hard to have some notion of preliminary data um, for putting two completely different things together. Um, and it's also, it's, it, uh, if you try to do that, you're not gonna be the, the best neuroscientist or the best machine learning person, let's say in the neuroscience AI example for a while. So, so the local incentives don't necessarily support that. Uh, that well, and so I think this is actually a place where, um, in practice, you know, I think we've observed sort of, in some broader sense, the EA community to actually start to to, to make some impact on this. So, so part part of the work around uh, physically expanding the brain was actually funded by the Open Philanthropy Project um, uh, about a year or so ago, um, and uh, the the project I described with the, the DNA barcodes was was uh, largely funded by IARPA. Um, in both cases, these are not traditional mechanisms of support. Um, so I think that um, you know, if just AI just proceeds in its own direction, neuroscience proceeds in its own direction, um, in the absence of some external incentive to try to get integration, then things may, things may actually um, not progress as, as quickly uh, as, as they could with, with some deliberate attempt to try to stimulate this, this, these kinds of ways of thinking. So. Well, if the angle you're taking on trying to integrate these two fields is certainly fascinating. How about another round of applause for Adam Marblestone? Thank you.